morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Carnegie Mellon University, where we do work that matters. I'm delighted to be here this morning to speak to you as part of the global TED community whose purpose is to seek a deeper understanding of the world around us. I would like to offer some thoughts as part of that process, particularly on the topic of technology impacting the 21st century, especially in the context of what many people call the fourth industrial revolution. As you may know, in the last two years or so, thought leaders, policy makers, heads of organizations from around the world, have, including those who have got, gathered at the World Economic Forum in Davos, have talked about Industry 4.0, or the fourth industrial revolution. In fact, I'm delighted to say that many of my colleagues from Carnegie Mellon University and I have played a very active role in that conversation, not just in Davos, but around the country and around the world. Before we get into the fourth industrial revolution, let's start with the first industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution is believed to have started in the late 18th century, where Power produced by steam and water led to mechanization. That industrial revolution created industrialized cities and it changed the world dramatically. Immediately after the first industrial revolution, many families around the world had their lives and livelihoods disrupted. One such family was that of a young man called Andrew Carnegie, who were a family of handloom weavers living in Dumfriesland, Scotland. Their lives were totally disrupted, and they had to move to seek a better life. They moved all the way, a family of seven of them who lived in one room, moved to Allegheny, Pennsylvania to seek a better life. Between the first industrial revolution and the second industrial revolution, which was primarily made possible and catalyzed by electricity, that second industrial revolution produced mass production. And Andrew Carnegie capitalized on it as a leader of industry. So the disruptions created by the first and second industrial revolution made Andrew Carnegie the richest American at one point in time when he sold Carnegie Steel to J.P. Morgan, and that helped create Carnegie Mellon University. I would not be standing here today if it were not for the first industrial revolution and second industrial revolution, and you will not be sitting here today. The third industrial revolution happened in the second half of the 20th century. During that time, we had microelectronics, information and communication technologies, and of course the internet. That led to unprecedented automation, and it produced global supply chain in ways in which we had not seen before. It also produced global networks for production. So that brings me to the fourth industrial revolution. What is it? The fourth industrial revolution is a unique convergence of the physical world, the digital world, and the biological world. They have never come together in such a way. So what are the key catalysts or ingredients of the fourth industrial revolution? Artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, big data and deep data analysis, and of course, securing the cyberspace and the cloud that connects all of this through mobile technology and through autonomy. 
The remarkable thing is that many of these ingredients of the fourth industrial revolution were pioneered at Carnegie Mellon University. Each of the previous industrial revolutions disrupted society in unprecedented ways, but society also adapted to them. Jobs were disrupted, lives were disrupted, there was migration because of the industrial revolution, there was inequality, there was poverty, there was starvation, but society adapted it. So given that we have these ingredients of the fourth industrial revolution, what are some of the characteristics of the fourth industrial revolution? So we have, for example, let me see if the slides move. In the fourth industrial revolution, we have robotics, artificial intelligence, etc. So what, how, how is the fourth industrial revolution supposed to change humanity? The first characteristic is that the pace of change has never been more rapid. So what does it mean? Our ability to produce technology is much faster, occurs at a much faster rate than our ability or society's ability to understand that technology and adapt to it through policies, practices, and regulations. That's one key feature. Because of that, there is fear that unlike previous industrial revolutions, our ability to catch up with the disruptions and make amendments, amends for this will not be fast enough. What is the future of labor? What is the future of education? And how do we make sure that lives that are disrupted are bettered in a reasonably fast period of time? And how do we make sure that the individual citizen of the world, whether he or she lives in a developing or a developed country, can participate in the revolution in a two-way process that, is, that we have never seen before? It also poses interesting questions. What does it mean to be human in the 20, 21st century when machines and robots influence lives? Do we, do we cede control? to machines, love, respect, passion, empathy, these human qualities, how do we ensure that we don't lose them? That is going to be extremely important. The, the great thing is that Carnegie Mellon University not only looks at technology, it also looks at the human dimension. It looks at the human dimensions of ethics, privacy, policy, confidentiality, intellectual property, all the human dimensions the arts, uh, the, the humanities, social sciences, etc., economics, business, and that's the unique strength of Carnegie Mellon University. Every societal disruption comes with intended benefits. The fourth industrial revolution has the potential to offer enormous benefits, to make us live better, perhaps make us live longer through better healthcare, better tools and technologies, better well-being, assisting disabled children to learn better through technology, assisting the elderly to live better and longer through technology. That's all possible. But also, there is potential downside. If you take a kitchen knife, a kitchen knife can be a very useful tool to make delicious meals. It can also be a lethal murder, murder weapon. How humans use and abuse technologies can come in anticipated ways, they can also come in unanticipated ways. So let me give you one example. We have early part of this century, the National Academy of Engineering released a report called the 20 Greatest Engineering Achievements of the 20th Century. Things like electrification, automobiles, air conditioning, commercial aviation, nuclear power, microelectronics, computer chips, the internet, et cetera, et cetera. A few, these are remarkable achievements of humanity. A few years later, the same National Academy of Engineering released another report, 14 grand challenges of the 21st century, sequestering carbon, containing nuclear terror, securing the cyberspace. So if you put the two lists side by side, 
Some of the grand challenges of the 21st century are a direct consequence of the achievement of the 20th century. So if you were so smart in the 20th century to create all these wonderful things, in the process created new problems, how much smarter are we likely to be just a few years later to solve these problems? And what new problems will we create in the 21st century? So that's the key question. Many people think there are many different ways to address this. My personal feeling is that technology has to be taken in the context of the human condition. Without that, it will not provide full benefits without unintended consequences. Technology comes in many different forms. There are big technologies that are often sexy and catch the imagination of the people. There are small technologies that are much more useful, but not many people pay attention to them. They don't get the attention of the press. Here is an example. In early part of the early 1960s, President John F. Kennedy made the famous statement, and I quote, we will put man on the moon before the decade is over and bring him home back safely. We achieved it. Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon in the late 60s. Many men and women have gone to outer space since that time, including many American women. This galvanized an entire generation of Americans to go into science and technology. This produced enormous benefits to society beyond NASA. That's all true. But somebody recently pointed out that, remember, we put man on the moon before we put wheels on the suitcase. <laughs> wheels on the suitcase is a useful invention which benefits hundreds of millions of people every day on Earth. Wheels have been around for millennia, but nobody thought of it until after we went to the moon. So it's very important to keep this in mind as we think about technology and society, as we pay attention to what the right ingredients are, the good news is that those of you sitting here and those of you working at Carnegie Mellon University are not only thinking about technology, you are also thinking about society. That's wonderful for humanity. Thank you very much.